Uh, Ray, thank you very much. It's a it's a treat to get to be a part of this conference today. And uh, you know, I I'm sitting here in front of you today because of a a lot of great specialists who have encouraged and motivated me and helped me out in the past, but also the cooperation of a lot of farmers. And so a true definition of cooperative extension, it takes, it takes an army to make things work. And so eventually someday they may make a decent county agent out of me yet. So that said, I'm excited to uh, uh, sort of set the stage and uh, be the startup band for Fred Thomas, one of my farmers. Got to travel with him a lot this week. Not picking up. I think we're hot now. Now we got it. Sorry about that. So it's been fun getting travel with Fred the last few days. I think we'll end up about 400 miles by the time the day is over. And so uh, I think if we take the long way home, Fred, today we can solve all the world's problems. So we'll have it figured out. So road time's always good to visit. So. Topic, uh, we covered this back at KCA Forge Convention a bit. Hay feeding strategies to build fertility and grazing systems. And we're, we're headed down the path where, where Greg was leaving off on bell grazing. But we're going to back up a little bit and consider a few things. And so I just want you to consider a typical farm. This one's 50 acres. If you're going to go out and soil test that farm, we read an extension publication. You know, the, the summary you may uh, develop is, you know, well, I need to divide this farm up. Uh, limit the samples to about 20 acres, no more than. Uh, sort of, you know, select these areas based on soil type, crop and history, erosion, pest management. Those things stick out in our mind. And so we may divide those 50 acres up to look something like this, 50 acres into four fields. And uh, we think about where existing fences, permanent fences may be, crop management, hay or pasture. The problem with that is, though, when we go, if we're buying a conventional fertilizer because of logistics and we do not want to have to make four trips to the dealer and the dealer doesn't want to make four trips to us, those uh, four samples may become two. Some situations may become one. And we all know the end result of that is we're either over applying or under applying nutrients. And so if we think about soil testing from a little bit different perspective, and I'm, I'm trying to steal a little bit of what our grain producers have been doing for some years. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, grain guys were talking about uh, grid sampling. They were splitting up their fields into acre and a half, two acre grids and, and doing sampling. And that really didn't accomplish all they wanted to. And so they, some have tinkered with, uh, well, let's just do it based upon a, a soil series, you know, divide it up that way or, or or they went, they went to management zones or, or yield zones, you know, different ways of taking more samples. And so I look at this farm and uh, I try to think of some, some places within the farm that may stand out. And so in red, uh, I've marked places where there's been hay fed, you know, several bales over the course of a winter. The green area is where the old tobacco patch used to be. You know, tobacco is unique in its fertility requirements. It may be a little bit different. The, the brown spot, that may be where a, a lot of manure has been spread, the, uh, the spreader, or maybe that's where we spread the stalks uh, from the tobacco patch. Uh, consider our high productivity areas. Uh, found grain crops, a lot of times those high productivity areas, we think of those, oh, they must be the best soil fertility. Oftentimes it's the opposite. We're pulling so much yield off from them, it's hard to keep it up. Identify the areas got broom sedge, because we don't like that. We can take into consideration our soil series and consider slope. And so when we do that, we may end up with 11 samples. Now, a few minutes ago, we couldn't manage four with granular fertilizer. So Nick, why are you trying to get me to pull more, more samples? And so it's obviously I'm, 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 I'm leading into talking about manure and how we can uh, better utilize the manure that's produced on our farm to develop nutrient management plants and the first step of developing a good nutrient management plan is being able to identify areas on your farm where fertility is needed. And so on this particular farm, like very many farms uh, in most parts of the state, phosphorus was, was either medium to, to high all across this farm. And so we're just looking at the potassium fertility levels. And if you can remember a few things on the previous slide, uh, I've got some low potassium, very low potassium in areas where we had broom sedge, places where hay has been fed fair bit in the past, we've got very high levels, and so we can use these results to try to pinpoint and target uh, where we need to try to get our manure at. 
Uh, we can look at our own hay for the source of these nutrients. Oftentimes we, uh, we quote book values, and I'll be quoting some book values in a minute, but when you do your forage testing this fall, if uh, when you get done balancing your rations, you can start looking at the uh, as-fed or as-received results and look at the crude protein there, your phosphorus, and your potassium level. And you can look in your proceedings and you may be able to follow along a little bit better, but there's a little bit of math that we can do to convert our crude protein level into pounds of nitrogen, convert our phosphorus into pounds of phosphate, and potassium into pounds to potash. And so we can do a calculation here to, in, in, in fer fertilizer terms, the, the amount of nutrients uh, that are in our hay. Some years ago back, uh, uh, Mr. Brandon Sears sitting back in the room, him and his, uh, his intern at the time, uh, Matt Thomas, done some work in Madison County looking at the average uh, bale weight of various size bales, so anywhere from a four to five to a five by six. Obviously, there's a decent range based on tightness of the bale, uh, but on average, a five by five was a thousand pounds. We take uh, December 21 quotes, what I got around home, and it came up to N, P, and K in the bale about $38.66, a five by six bale weighing 1,500 pounds, $58. These are AGR assumptions at your fertilizer guide, 35 pounds N, 18 pounds of phosphate, 50 pounds of potash. Uh, considered per ton. If you want to look at it another way and, and, and go through a nutrient management plan, uh, this is an example of our UK uh, management plan calculator. If we consider 40 mature beef cows, uh, 20 uh, calves, average weight of 300 pounds, feed them hay for 120 days, and if we can imagine for a moment that we can capture every pound of manure that comes from those animals, which is not realistic, but if we imagine if we can for a minute and make, make use of it, that's 291 tons for the winter. We look at what that contains. It contains eight pounds of nitrogen, 4.1 pounds of phosphate, 6.6 .6 on potassium. There are some availability factors. That nitrogen is gonna be at risk of volatilization and denitrification, and we do not utilize 100% of the P and K either. But we carry the math forward, do those calculations, put a value to it. We're at a, just a bit over $7.5 a ton uh, value of our manure. Put that back on the 291 tons produced in this particular uh, scenario. We're looking at $2,200 worth of manure for the winter. Now, these facilities have, uh, have become popular in recent years and for good reason. I mentioned yesterday, I think hay feeding ought to be one or two things because it's so costly and so aggravating. It either needs to be really easy or somewhat fun or, or intriguing, entertaining, possibly a, a, a two bird, one stone type of program, and that's what we're leading into. And so these are the, these are the easy option. They're not cheap, but they're, they make life a little bit easier in the wintertime. When we develop nutrient management plans for these structures, we assume that at best we're capturing about 30% of those nutrients. And so that 2,200 and something dollars I showed a while ago, you only get a third of that. But that's only if you keep this machine running fairly frequently, and keep that pad cleaned off, and there's a cost of operating that machine. And so we, we do leave some nutrients on the table. The other aspect of this is biggest part of your potassium and nitrogen is excreted from the cow via the urine. So we're not gonna capture that in our manure spreaders. And so it does not always match the goal of, uh, of utilizing all those nutrients produced from feeding hay. Before we get too far in depth, I, I don't want to overlook or fail to mention the, the value in terms of recycling nutrients and, and keeping nutrients distributed throughout our pastures. Uh, don't wanna discount or leave out the, the, the value of, increase, of extending the grazing season, whether it being uh, stockpiled fescue, if we strip graze that, we not only increase utilization, but we can increase the distribution of nutrients. Also, uh, drilling in uh, cereal rye, annual rye grass type of winter crops. Got a lot of Adair County farmers are doing that uh, these days. So both very effective, good strategies to employ. Unrolling hay. You know, we can pinpoint those low areas of potassium on that farm by unrolling hay. It works great. It falls apart just a little bit 
whenever things get real wet and, and muddy out. But it can be effective. But uh, Fred's going to tell us about bell grazing. And uh, this whole story starts back some years ago with an email from Dr. Lim Cooler was trying to find some, some agents to do some on-farm tinkering and studies and projects. And, uh, and I was, I guess I was looking for a project too. And I said, Jeff, I, I think I can come up with something. And I had worked with Fred in the past. And Fred's and soil samples been brought in. It was, it's, it's, a, it's a county agent's fear. It's the hardest question we, we get. And we hadn't had a good answer for it for, for so many years. But it's a, you get soil test results back that the fertility levels are so low, you know that the calf crop's not going to make, make that fertilizer payment. And so how, how do we fix that? And so uh, we tossed the idea of Fred of, of working with us to trying to uh, demo and attempt some some bell grazing practices and, and Fred he he was he was ready to give it a shot and so uh, this was the first year we was trying it and we uh, we put the bells pretty close and uh, as you can see we done a great job tearing that field up <laughs> but you know uh, you know extension there's no such thing as failures it's just new opportunities and so uh, we was able to utilize this field with some sedan grass through that summer. For fertilizer free, it grew on its own, there's plenty there, and then established endophyte, novel endophyte fescue in that, that, that fall. So we demonstrated not only a way to build fertility, but also eradicate not, uh, infected fescue and reestablish new. So it, it was a win, folks. These are some amazing numbers. And so this, this shows where Fred had been feeding hay in the wintertime. Phosphorus testing 595, potassium 927. Those are environmentally unfriendly levels. In the area that we bell graze, start out phosphorus soil test at 30. After we got done bell grazing, we were at 90. Started potassium 104, we got done with 349. I cannot tell you how to do the math to get those soil test levels increase that much with granular fertilizer, but I know it's going to be outrageous, and I don't think anybody wants to write that check. So Fred has continued bell grazing over the years, and, and, and he has tweaked uh, from the original bell space and tried a lot of new strategies and uh, has learned a lot from it. And so this is over the long term, uh, 2014, you know, his phosphorus levels were in the 20s. Uh, today, 2021, on average across the farm, he's in the 160 areas, uh, so great improvements. Uh, potassium levels uh, in, the, in the 70s. Where he's been bell grazing, he's getting up there very high, uh, over 500, uh, to a point where he may need to start pulling some hay off that. And he'll tell you that he has in some situations to try to cash in on some of those nutrients. And so with that said, Fred, get you come up and join us, and Fred will give you the, uh, the rest of the story on bell grazing.